Well, thank you all for being here, and I know I know many of you out there. I saw your hands go up, and you've heard me talk before, and I think I'll just, I have to let you know where we've come from to know where we're going. And uh, again, Charlie, it's been a long, great road, and all of the staff and volunteers with WCN, we are spreading the message everywhere. And Saving Wildlife is really about the messages, and it's working with people. Um, cheetahs are the fastest land animal. I think they're the most amazing animal. This is a cheetah named Little C, and he's um, my partner Bruce's favorite cheetah. So I might tell you some of the names of some of the cheetahs that are there. We do have orphans that come into us, and so I end up having to take care of a number of rescued cheetahs as well. Most of the work we do is to try to keep cheetahs living in the wild. I'm going to tell you a little bit about their ecology and really what's going on with them worldwide. And today we've got quite a bit of problem. And then a bit about our programs and conservation, and then really how the future looks and where you can be a part of that future as well. Cheetahs play a very important role in the ecosystem. They maintain the grasslands. See that grass that's out there and the wildlife that's there? They maintain the wildlife herds by keeping them smart and fast and weeding out the sick and the dumb and the weak and the slow. So with that, they also feed the rest of the system. And where I live, people don't like jackals very much. I think here in the United States, people don't like coyotes that much. And so much of it is that we don't understand where they all fit in. But actually, animals like vultures and jackals, they actually clean up everything that's out there. And the cheetah makes a kill, eats fast, other animals come in, and so the cheetah feeds an ecosystem. And when you have a top predator like the cheetah, you've got more biodiversity. So really, we're looking at maintaining predators to maintain biodiversity. The cubs are lovely. Um, they can have up to six cubs, four to five is most average. We see quite a high infant mortality, both in the wild as well in captivity, and we've studied a lot about the cheetahs in captivity to even know more about them in the wild because you don't really go to see a den that often to find out what's going on. Their eyes open at about 10 days. The mother has the cubs. She raises them on her own for about 18 to 22 months of age. So female cheetahs are, they're the best. Female cheetahs take the best care of their cubs, but she's on her own caring for them for that period of time, and it's a big job. Male cheetahs live together. They form a coalition. Uh, they spend a lot of their time marking territories. Females cover multiple males' territories. Females have what's called mate choice. And so a good male will start probably breeding when he's about four to five years of age. And in between that time, until he maybe is able to hold a territory, he's spending his time dispersing and leaving his scent and trying to actually find an area where there's maybe good prey and where a female cheetah might want to bring her cubs most often. Cheetahs are actually one of the oldest of all of the cats, and this is kind of what the cat history looks like. But just to let you know that they've been revered by people for about 5,000 years. Kings, emperors, and princes have all loved them, but they've loved them to near extinction. They brought them in, they wanted them to be pets. They are easily tamed, unfortunately, better than all the other cats, and with that, they um, have used them as companions for hunting, a sport called coursing, and from that, they don't breed well in captivity, and the populations have thinned down throughout their range. The cheetah's closest relative is that of the North and South American cougar, or mountain lion, and the South American jacarundi, which is a small cat. And you can see the pictures here of who their closest relatives are. Now, hmm. Everybody always asks, well, how did you get involved in this? And for my friends that are out there, and you already know this, that uh, I am a horsewoman. I grew up on the back of a horse. I love my horse. I still ride every day. And if anybody comes and visits to Namibia, I always say, what are you doing in the morning? You want to go riding. I'm also a dog lover and a goat lover. I think I love every animal there is. <laughs> but um, I grew up in California. I grew up in Southern California, and my parents then established um, their home in Santa Cruz, where my mother still lives now. And I thought that I was going to be a veterinarian. And instead, I went from Napa to Davis and became a winemaker and a grape grower. So how did I end up there? 
in Namibia from California, and I ended up in Oregon at a place called the Wildlife Safari, and this was in the early 1970s. I started and was the kind of the pioneer of the Oregon wine industry, but as a, I guess, entrepreneur, I had my own vineyard and small winery, I needed a job to support it. Well, I had a dairy goat farm, and I was making milk, um, and I was selling my milk, and then I, the wildlife safari had just opened up, it was five miles from my vineyard, and I had never seen a cheetah before in my entire life. And I went down there and I said, I live down the road and I've got goat milk, can I bring it into your nursery? And they said, well, what do you do? Gave them my background with animals and they said, well, you're in charge of the clinic now. So I ran a veterinary clinic for um, 16 years and with that, the first thing that I wanted to know more about was about cheetahs. And I asked questions and they said, when you find out something about cheetahs, let the world know. And this is Charlie when I was still writing letters back in those days. And I wrote to people all around the world and I wanted to know anything I could find out about cheetahs. They said they don't breed well in captivity, we're losing them in the wild, and good luck. So I set up the most successful breeding program of cheetahs in North America. And uh, the more I learned, the more fascinated I became. And I tried to share the knowledge that I had as a young person with everybody that I could. And then, actually, I found myself doing a research project in the middle 1970s where I and this cheetah, whose name is Kayam, ended up in Namibia, Southwest Africa, where her parents had come from. And my job back in the middle 70s was to take my cheetah to Africa and teach her how to hunt. Hmm. So it sounds a lot like that born free. You can hear the music. I always could hear the music. And I thought, well, what does this really mean? So I just want to honor Kayam today, and I did teach her how to hunt. We both learned how to hunt very well, like a very good mother cheetah. And from that, though, um, after spending months there in Namibia, I came back with her. She didn't stay. And um, I spread the word about trying to save the cheetah. And I honor Kayam. and a few years ago, about six years ago, I was given an opportunity by the World Conservation Union, um, the IUCN, to actually name International Cheetah Day. And so I picked December 4th because that was the day of her birth. And if it had not been for her birth, and it had not been the fact that I went over to Namibia and learned all that I learned, we would never be where we are today with cheetahs. So che Kayam took me on this path of a life that I had no idea that I'd be living. What I found out there um, with Kayam is that the farmers were catching cheetahs. They were catching and killing them, and they had no idea that the cheetah was very, very special. And this is what I first saw, was the cats in capture cages and farmers shooting them, and the farmers going, you're nuts, what are you doing with the cheetah? Who Kayam was purring and licking their hand at the same time as she had learned how to hunt. And they went, is there something, you know, you're telling us something about cheetahs that we really didn't know that much about. And so this conflict, I kept saying, somebody's got to stop the farmers from killing the cheetahs. And I thought somebody would, and I always call that the they factor, that we think that they will take care of things, and there is no they, we are the they. And so from that, again, Kayam changed my life. As I came back to the United States, I got very involved more in the, the research. We had one of the only facilities that had cheetahs. I started teaming up with people from the National Zoo and the National Cancer Institute, and we discovered that the cheetah lacks genetic diversity. By looking at blood, back in those days, the genetics that we were working on was electrophoresis, we found that they had reproductive abnormalities, 70% abnormal sperm. We also looked at problems with them um, disease-wise and then really looked at the genetics and found that they went through a population bottleneck probably around 12 to um, 10,000 years ago, leaving them all very, very genetically the same. So after that, going through a lot of the research that I'd been involved in, um, Kayam had passed away and I'd moved from Oregon to the Washington DC area and at Namibia's independence, and I kept going back and forth to not only Namibia, other parts of Africa. Um, in 1990, when Namibia got its independence from South Africa, I did. I 
sold everything I had, and I had enough money for that old Land Rover right there. And I uh, packed my bags and moved to Namibia. And I went there, and I wanted to know why farmers were killing cheetahs. In the 1980s, during the time that I was coming and going and trying to ask who's going to save the cheetah, there were about 10,000 cheetahs that were killed by the Namibian farmers. And that really concerned me. And then as I got to Namibia, I went door to door and I talked to the farmers and the farmers basically said, well, you know, you've, they've got all these problems and you should just be a Namibian farmer. So I am. I now have, we started with a small farm um, and you can't get small, small backyard farms. We started with um, a farm that was donated to us of 14,000 um, acres. We now have 100,000 acres. But we're an integrated farm, that of livestock and wildlife all together. And I work throughout all of the cheetah's range, working with all of our different partners. And I've been fortunate because a lot of people do care. And so I've helped develop a lot of the different organizations for cheetahs throughout the cheetah's range. I'd like to share with you where the cheetah is found today. On the yellow map up here is where the cheetahs were found um, in around 1900. And we've, there were about 100,000 cheetahs then. Um, then the, yellow, the red there is where they were probably in 2007. We now today are found in these green populations here and the last of the Asian population in Iran where there are probably about 60 cheetahs there. Today our population looks to be about 7,100 individual adults and sub-adults. Um, we uh, have 31 populations. 50% of them are found in southern Africa and 20 of those populations are less than 100 individuals. So it's very, very scary because under 100 individuals doesn't make them very viable genetically. Um, I live here in Namibia, and we've doubled our population of cheetahs in the 27 years that I've been based there. But from that, that's why we work in all of the other ranges. Most of the cheetahs are found outside of protected areas, so they're not in a safe haven. And that is why um, we have to work so closely with people and people, so, and farmers and livestock farmers. So livestock farmers, you would call them ranchers here. We don't have anything but cattle and goats and sheep and wildlife to ranch because we don't have very much water. Namibia is very, very, very arid. The problems facing the cheetah really revolve around um, loss of habitat. We've got issues with human-wildlife conflict. Problems with the socioeconomic side, and I always try to point out that Africa is a continent that is, um, is amazing with its wildlife, but it's growing in its human population more than any other continent in the world today. We've got about 1.1 billion people in the sub-Saharan Africa, and that population is going to double in about another 25 years. That also means that without having alternative livelihoods, livestock becomes a very important part of people's lives. And so the livestock populations are going to quadruple. We've got illegal wildlife trafficking that I'm going to talk with you more about. Loss of genetic diversity has caused even greater problems reproductively for them. So we're actually dealing with very, very low numbers. And potentially a catastrophe is ahead of us, but we know about it, we've studied it. What we can do now is change that. The survival of the cheetah is really in humans' hands. Our program areas are three-pronged. We deal with research, conservation, and education. And we are the primary repository of all the science knowledge uh, from reproductive and genetic and overall health of the population. We work with everybody everywhere who has cheetahs. We're trying to ensure through conservation that there's going to be a habitat and prey for the cheetah, as well as working on trying to look at alternative livelihoods and mitigate the conflict and also work together globally through international awareness. So I spend uh, a couple months a year talking and talking to everybody that I can about the issues facing the cheetah's survival. At our center, um, we are a sanctuary for orphan cheetahs. Today we have 35 cheetahs at our center that have come to us by the Ministry of Environment. Um, cubs often found without a mother or the mother shot, and then we get the cubs, and so we work very closely with our ministry. We have a veterinary clinic, we have a full-scale genetics laboratory, we're a training facility, we have livestock guarding dogs and a goat dairy now, 
as well as a habitat restoration program, and we are open to the public. So we welcome people, and this past year, in 2016, we actually had 10,000 visitors that came to our center. And we're down at Dirt Road, about 45 minutes from a small little town. So for us, that was very, very inspirational to have our 10,000th person. As I said, we work with partners throughout the Cheetahs range, and so from Namibia, we've had people from all the different range states come down and trained, and I'm very, very proud of the partners that we continue to work with. I want to talk with you a little bit about illegal wildlife trafficking, because today it is a big problem, and we're kind of on the hot seat at it. In September was the CITES conference, and that is the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species, and it happened to be in Johannesburg. We've been working for a number of years to try to get recommendations into the CITES conference. There's a lot of trafficking that's going on for the cheetahs from the um, Horn of Africa, where the populations there in those countries, as you can see, are only about 1,600. We're seeing about 300 cheetahs a year being trafficked from this area. And what we're trying to do is to try to affect the change through education and working with the range states there in the Gulf um, where the cheetahs are being trafficked to. And they're going over into places like the UAE, into Saudi Arabia, into Oman. And for every one cheetah that might make it, we are actually losing about five cubs. And we just recently had a confiscation of um, nine cheetahs in Somaliland. This has just gone on in the last couple weeks. And um, our, our partner, who uh, CCF staff, Patricia, is right here. She was just in Somaliland, and that is, she's working right there. Uh, the lady with her is the Minister of Environment and Tourism. We're trying to figure out a way to stop this trafficking. Of the nine cats that were actually confiscated with the help of the ministry, already three of those cats have died in only a matter of a couple days. If you can see this picture right here, whoops, I'll go back one. That little guy didn't make it. You can see what he looks like. And this is really the problems that we're facing. So that's just one of the issues that we've got. Now I'm going to come back to keeping cheetahs living free and in the wild, because that's really what we want to do. We want them living free in Somaliland. We want them living free in Kenya, in Namibia, and Botswana, in Algeria, and Iran. And in order to do that, there's a lot of things that we need to deal with, and that's understanding how the people live, what their problems are, what they want in life. And um, I'm a farmer, I like to farm. Farmers, ranchers, you know, we don't make a lot of money, but it's the love of the land and the love of the livestock. Most of the people that are out there don't really want to be uh, doing what they do, being a rancher like this. Um, and so finding out what it is that they aspire to, I think, has helped us figure out a way to stop the trapping and stop the killing of the cheetahs. Again, this is what happens when the cats are caught. This is the last group of cheetahs that we ended up with uh, last August. So we've had a very great impact in Namibia, where, as I said, uh, in the 1980s, the people were catching and killing about eight, 900 cheetahs a year, 10,000 in a 10-year period. When I first moved to Namibia 27 years ago, we were working on 50 and 60 cheetahs a year. Most of them we'd been able to now be able to put back out in the wild. Now, the last cats that we worked on that were caught were in August. So you can see the benefit of being on the ground for such a long period of time. Once an animal has been caught, we do maximize everything that we can by collecting blood, tissue, understanding the biology. If it's an adult animal, we will, especially, well, if it's a male, we'll bank down the sperm. We've got a um, genome resource bank for, um, for long term. We work with our collaborators from the Smithsonian and the, the um, colleagues from many of the different universities. And, that of Cornell, which I'm a professor there. So we've got international collaborators that we work with everywhere. Our samples are available and to be used by multiple other collaborators as well, and we've got a huge database on this. But over 900 individuals, cheetahs, that we've actually had our hands on. And I've learned an awful lot about every single one of those cheetahs, and it's allowed us to actually make a lot of different other programs to assist cheetahs here that are living in captivity, working with our partners in other or, um, organizations throughout all of Africa. Most of the cheetahs we have been able to put back out in the wild in Namibia, and uh, giving you an idea of what a home range looks like, that 
these are, each one of these little white areas is a farm of about 10,000 acres. So a cheetah covers very, very large areas. So you can't just buy a piece of land and hope you can put a lot of animals on there. You have to actually um, work with all the people on the land so that the cheetahs have a place to live. We look at how the cheetahs are living also by using camera traps. And these camera traps have taught us uh, an understanding of how many cheetahs are out there. So we see a very, very low density. We know they're living in a low density, but it's given us a lot of information that has been able to um, understand now where the cheetahs more, more are living. But just two to 12 cheetahs per 50 square mile, 500 square miles, which is, um, again, a very low density. They go to these marking trees where the farmers um, used to think that they were, they're called play trees, and they'd see cheetahs up there, and they thought that the cheetahs were going in the trees and playing like the cubs are. But really, they're a marking tree where the males spend their time marking the, the, the tree through urine and, and feces, and that actually shows territoriality, and it's like reading a newspaper. The females come there and know which male's dominant, maybe where he's going, who she would like to breed with, and um, the other males know who's around in the area. So marking territories is always a very important part of what's going on. We are going and we've been, for the last two years, been in a big project throughout our entire region here, and um, this is the Waterberg National Park, and these are the farms. The, these are our farms where CCF is based right in here, and these are the farmers around the Waterberg, and we're doing this huge study to find out more about all of the predator array which is out there using camera traps. And it's been a very great um, understanding and working with the farming community for them to know more about where the leopards are, the cheetahs, um, in many areas, the wild dogs as well. But we do use detection dogs. And so when we're going out into these different areas and there's play trees and we're trying to find um, more about the cheetah, and we use dogs and they find scat. And we call the scat actually black gold because it's, it, you can find out a whole lot about not only the genetic makeup of the cheetah, but we can find out about what the cheetah ate through um, looking at the, the scat and the hair that's in there, and we identify that. We've got huge libraries. Yeah, even the parasitology, the parasites that are within the cheetahs as well. So these are some of the dogs that we have that are working. And um, this is our newest dog right here. His name is Nuka. We are, we've got a couple that are retired. Unfortunately, Tiger, who is our really hard-working dog, um, a year ago broke his shoulder. And so he now is basically retired. And we're trying to get a new dog up from South Africa that's been trained. And um, we're, we're trying to get the funding to try to get that dog to us in the next few weeks. And Finn, who has been a master um, scat finding dog. He's now nine years old, and so their life isn't going to be all that long, as well as Isha, who is a great um, scat finding dog. She is also nine years of age, so it's a process of continually training them. So as they're trained, they um, go out in the field, they get water, they get caretakers. We've got um, really good dog handlers, and then what we want to find is the black gold and then it gets bagged up, it gets separated out for our variety of different studies, and then it comes into our genetics laboratory. And this is Anne and Fabiano, and Anne is the, she runs our genetics lab, and these are a couple of our um, master's students from either, I think they're from Zimbabwe, as well as from Namibia. We work with a variety of universities, and we get master's and PhD students from throughout all of Africa. But they Samples come into our genetics lab, and then what we're trying to do is to identify those individual cheetahs by uh, extracting the DNA, and then from that, what we can do is we can find the different individuals. And then also overlapping it with our camera trap photos, we can even sometimes get a picture of the animal and ID it back to the animal and the scat. But this cheetah here, whoops, is different, He's, you can see that that fingerprint is different. And so these are using microsatellites. And even though the cheetah is very genetically the same, we do have enough, and these microsatellites are very fast um, change, that we are able to actually identify the different individuals. So we get scat and hair, we're getting animals, even from this illegal wildlife trafficking, we're getting scat from as far away as um, Ethiopia and northern Kenya. 
I want to talk for a second about some of our reintroductions that have gone on, because this is also something that's happening right away. It is, um, remember, I started by seeing if a captive-born cheetah could go back out in the wild, of which she did learn how to hunt, but she was tame. And we have a lot of animals that come to us. And about 10 years ago, we started looking at rewilding. This is one of the females that we've had a great success with. This is three years of her point data of how she's living in the area. Uh, we're based right in here, and so she likes our area here. She gave birth to her cubs over in here, and this is what the birthing area looked like. And that's the den where the cubs were. So it gives an idea of what, where you know, cheetahs are living. And during the three years that we were tracking her, she was never caught catching livestock. And our neighborhood all learned about her as well, which is very, very exciting. And the main prey, because every time we found a cluster, we'd go in and look at the kill, was steenbok, which is a small little antelope, what we find mostly female cheetahs like. And then she was able to actually raise three cubs successfully. And for rewilding and reintroduction, that's very important. Just about two months ago, we put three male cheetahs back out. These guys are called the inmates, or Donner, Dexter, and Alcatraz. <laughs> and that's Alcatraz sitting up here looking as happy as he can being free. And putting them out, I've got staff out there monitoring them um, regularly. They're doing very well. They've started hunting. Males don't hunt and get going as fast as females do. And so you, we do supplementally feed them until they actually get going. Females usually start hunting on their own when we put them out after a few days. Males, it's taken now, um, they're at, as I said, about two months, and they are hunting, but they are, um, I would say, just a little bit behind how the females usually are. That we're very, very pleased that they're doing well. We've been about uh, 50 cheetahs that have gone out in a 10-year period of time. All of them are collared, and it's all about long-term research because some of these cheetahs, we may in the future put cats back into some of the ranges where the cheetah numbers are low. So cheetahs need very, very large areas in order to live. And our research always leads into conservation. We are a science-based organization looking at applied conservation. And one of the things that makes, I think, Namibia different in Africa than many of the other countries is that we have big lands. Um, Namibia is two and a half times the size of California. And the green areas are where our wildlife parks are. And here, there are less than 100 cheetahs living in those wildlife parks. Most of the cheetahs are found in the center area of the country here and the brown area, which are conservancies. All of these that I've marked here are wildlife conservancies. And Namibia, um, like many countries in the world, had a lot of wildlife 100 years ago. The numbers dropped because of people not knowing the value. And our numbers of wildlife are increasing. And it's because we believe in our country, in Namibia, that wildlife has a great value. And we are very active in the Conservancy Initiative. And these are not where game fences are. It's where animals live at freely. And with that, it's an integrated system where you've got livestock on the land as well as wildlife. And if you can protect your livestock and grow enough grass and have wildlife, then there's a double benefit of having the, um, the wildlife on your land because ecotourism plays a very important role. One of the areas that we work closest with is called and the Greater Waterberg Landscape. So you can see where it's located, and that's where all of our research is. This is the Waterberg National Park, and our land abuts that. So um, our land is right over here. The National Park is here. We work with, that's where we've gridded out with all of the camera traps all around it. We have wild dogs in this area. We have rhinos and cheetahs, and there's about 23,000 people that are my family and the people that I work closest with. And um, from that, what we've been able to do by working so closely with them is we've been able to find where the hot spots are for many of the different um, problem animals. So within this area, you, these are the areas that are circled where the hot spots are primarily for the wild dog, which is one of the last populations of wild dogs 
um, in the world. So working together with uh, Zimbabwe and Botswana, our wild dogs are very, very important. The farmers are killing the animals, but we, again, by knowing where they are, and I say we're circling those areas, so we're going to sit out there and work directly with the farmers, especially this year during the denning season of the wild dogs, which is June, July, and August, to try to stop them from killing the animals. We do training, and our training is called Future Farmers of Africa. So being an old farmer myself, I started finding out, well, do you guys know how to take care of your livestock? And the answer was is no. So even as simple as trimming hooves became very questionable, and if your animal's limping, it's going to be behind. And then how to actually train people. And if you overgraze the land, just like this over here, and earlier pictures, then there's no grass, and then your animals are going to die from starvation. So there's a whole lot of different issues that we actually spend our time teaching. And record keeping is also very, very important. And a lot of people didn't know how to do record keeping and when your breeding season is, and to know which animal might be giving birth or is sick. And you can understand a lot more through record keeping as well. One of the things, uh, we, again, we've trained thousands of farmers. And just um, last year alone, we did about 2,000 farmers in workshops. These are long-term relationships that we have with the farming communities. And we did pre-workshop questionnaires. And we found, yes, that most of them didn't have any knowledge about what was going on with their livestock. And then post the workshops, we found that they did have a greater knowledge. We found that just by giving them training, we could reduce their livestock loss by nearly 65%. That's a loss by teaching them how to trim hooves, how to maybe give a vaccine, what a parasite is, how to care for their livestock, how much grass it's going to need, when to sell the animal. And so we are constantly putting on workshops, and we very much need support for that. Another program that's been very successful, and that's our, our, our Livestock Guarding Dog program. We started this program in the um, early 1990s. We now have dogs scattered throughout the country. It's a large breed of dog. It's a Turkish breed. It's called the Anatolian Shepherd or the Kangal. And um, Paige and Chapa up there manage that program, and we've uh, got several other people on the road constantly because we breed the dogs at our center. And we've had over 600 puppies born. This year alone, we will have about 50 puppies born. We have 15 breeding animals. And we will breed our female once a year. And we've got to keep our new bloodlines coming. And when we retire a dog, the dog stays there for the rest of its life at our center as well. We place the puppies when they're about 10 weeks of age. And they grow up with the livestock. They've been vaccinated, they've been neutered, and then we care for the farmer. And we check them at three months, six months, 12 months, and annually thereafter. And we see that when the dogs are out there, they protect the flock, they can work with the herder, and they keep the other predators away. So in the name of the cheetah, we've seen a 80 to 100% decline in all livestock loss not just to the cheetah, but to the other predators as well. So the farmers don't have to kill the jackals. They don't have to kill the leopards. We're teaching the farmers that they can live in harmony. We've recently placed our dogs with cattle, which is new in Namibia. Although it has been used in some of the other areas, finding the farmers to work with us has been a very big job. So we will, again, be placing about 50 puppies a year. We ask for sponsorship and help to um, help us get those puppies out there, and it is a big job, and I've got a large staff who are on the road constantly with farmers. We've got new programs that we're working on. GPS collars that we are putting on cheetahs. We're probably going to be putting some soon on wild dogs to look at this overlap with the wild dogs and that of the leopards and the cheetahs in the area. We're looking at something called e-shepherd collars, and these emit a very loud sound, and we're trying to experiment with these e-shepherd collars in some of the areas where, um, where we don't have dogs to find out if we can keep the predators away. And also the use of lights um, around some of these different um, corrals and working together with the communities on these new solutions. Um, our education programs continue to be very, very successful. We will work with about 20,000 school kids um, this year alone and having school 
teachers and kids coming to our center. We'll probably get about 2,000, but we primarily go out to the schools and travel throughout all of Namibia, and I think that that is extremely important because so many of the kids that we've worked with for the years have now become actually um, partners as they go into things like the Ministry of Environment and Tourism or that of the Ministry of Agriculture and um, in business and they've all learned a lot about the things that we've done so long-term programs are very very important and these are some of our interns from this year alone and our next generation of our conservation scientists are very very impressive I'm very very proud of them from um, conservation um, scientists, geneticists, veterinary students. This is the first class of veterinary students uh, for Namibia. We've got a brand new veterinary um, school and they will be graduating in the next two years. So it's exciting. We get food scientists down with us. We have students in agriculture and in marketing. So Namibia is coming into its own and our education programs I think are extremely important. I want to update you on the work that's going on with our habitat program as well. So cheetahs need prey and they need to have a habitat and if the habitat has been overgrazed we end up having it look like that sand desert or in many of the places like Namibia and many of the other countries where the cheetah is found, a lot of the land becomes thick in the thorn bush. And I know those of you who know me and have heard my talk before, you know that I talk about this area, an area about the size of California, that is so thickly thornbush that we've gone from an open savanna into an area that is almost impenetrable. And that's how the cheetah is living in many of its last ranges. And so we have a habitat restoration program where we restore the habitat by, um, by selectively harvesting it and then we make chips and we can get about 10,000 tons per hectare and we are a Forest Stewardship Council certified organization. And uh, from that our logs, and we make a fuel log which is called bush block and the logs come out of a, an extruder here. This is some of our staff and we've got men and women, we've got about 35 people employed and just recently we've gotten this which is called a carbonizer and it makes green charcoal. So we're taking those logs and they're very, very heavy, and we are putting them through this carbonizer, and they come out looking like that, except they're black, and they weigh half the weight. And so this new carbonizer is actually pretty exciting. It's call, called green um, charcoal, and Namibia um, is very, very excited about this. We got a grant from the EU to put this carbonizer up. Our big scale, though, up is to try to go into biomass electricity. And we are still hoping in the next um, couple years to be able to show that we can take the biomass, make electricity, and that will assist our communities. And communities are important, and one of the things that we have actively tried to develop has been some crafts. And the crafts are out there at our booth, and many of you have seen them before. But working with the ladies in Africa is very important. And these are many of the ladies that um, work with us, and they th are coming up with new designs um, and really how to um, make things that we can sell and so we're actually trying to market these crafts now in particular to a lot of our zoo partners because it links it back to the wildlife that is on their land. So our zoo partners play a very important role in the lives of our communities as well. We are sustainable and are trying to get sustainable. We've got a great garden that grows and um, a greenhouse. We also make our own cheeses because we've got our goats and our, our dairy and our cheeses are wonderful and our cheeses now are going throughout many of the lodges throughout Namibia. Our cheeses are pasteurized. I always say that they are made through USDA regulations because we're kind of making up those regulations and helping train Namibia as well. I've just been very active with many of our conservation partners on a book that's going to be coming out in November and it's um, the Cheetah Biology and Conservation. It's a book by Elsevier and it's The Biodiversity of the World, um, Conservation from Genes to Landscapes. So we've had over 70 co-authors, it's a 40 chapter book, it's anything you'd ever want to know about all the science behind saving the cheetah. And our deadline is in the next couple days, so I've been actively working with all of my colleagues around the world to finish our book. 
And I've just put out a book called Chewbacca, which is out on our table, along with that of our future for cheetah. And Chewbacca was a very special, very special cheetah that people knew for over 16 years when he lived at CCF. And it's a kid's book that I'm very proud of, and we will always remember our friend Chewbacca. I welcome you to come into Namibia. Namibia is now called Ochivarongo, our town, the cheetah capital of the world. We have a cheetah that actually welcomes people into our town. These are those livestock farmers that were killing cheetahs like flies. They put a cheetah up there and they actually still really like me. Um, <laughs> we've got a guest house and so we do welcome people to come to our guest house. And right now we're making a small little lodge too. And it will be open by the 1st of June. So again, we do welcome people to come over and learn about um, cheetah conservation, learn about Namibia, learn about all of our wildlife. We welcome volunteers and interns. And this is the deck of the um, new guest house. And right where it says CCF welcomes volunteers and interns, that's the Waterberg Plateau Park that you see an entire view of the Waterberg. And it's actually very, very beautiful. I'd also like to welcome you over to Namibia in January where we are hosting um, along with Colorado State and the Large Carnivore Forum from Namibia and the Namibia Nature Foundation, which is the Pathways Africa. It's a conference in human dimensions. And many of the different university students uh, might be interested. Um, many of the government people from around um, all of Africa will be there, as well as many of our NGO partners. So I know a lot of our partners from WCN will also be there, and I'd like to invite you all to come as well. Strategies forward, we're going to expand what we're doing and community issues. We need to um, implement this work. We are growing our capacity as an organization. We're expanding our partnerships throughout the ranges, and we do need to increase our fundraising in order to save the cheetah. We probably have about five to 10 years if we do not do the work and scale up the jobs that I've showed you, we're not going to have the cheetah, and we do need to. If any of you would like to get involved locally, we do have a Northern California chapter, and Angie is back at our booth here, and many of our volunteers are here, and we'd welcome any of you to get more engaged in cheetah conservation. So thank you for having me here today and letting me tell you and update you on what's going on with the cheetah. Follow us on Facebook, and um, we try to share all of our stories with everybody. So thank you very much, and I would be able to answer some questions if anybody would like to ask a question. So thank you.